Lucy Powell, uh, Labour MP, of course, and a shadow minister for business and consumers. Good morning to you, Lucy. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much indeed. Now, we've obviously got a, a, a topic we want to talk about specifically uh, with you, but I want to ask you in terms of, of the, the Prime Minister talking about how he'd be haunted for the rest of his life by the pandemic and this call from your party leaders, Keir Starmer, for there to be uh, a, a, a public inquiry starting sooner rather than later. What do you think the key lessons are that need to be learned from the uh, first year of this pandemic? Well, I mean, I wouldn't want to, to prejudge some of that, really, but I think... For me, some of that is about the 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 lack of resilience, the lack of preparedness, uh, and some of the deep seated inequalities that we have in our country uh, going into this pan- pandemic that left us more exposed than other other countries. For me, they would be the bigger, deeper lessons rather than I think, as your your previous uh, interview was saying, they're apportioning you know blame on on individuals. You know, we've seen this pandemic really exposed those inequalities in health. You know, if you were already uh, more unhealthy going into this pandemic, you were much more likely to be hospitalised and die. In wealth, if you're poorer, if you're working in uh, insecure, low-paid work, you were much more likely to die or to be seriously uh, ill. Some of our public services, particularly social care, which has been underfunded and undervalued for many, many years, uh, you know, has been really exposed and, and has led to that higher death toll. So for me, it would be some of those deeper lessons about how, as a country, we could be uh, more resilient and uh, less exposed to these kind of crises and pandemics in the future. OK, oh, thank you very much indeed for that. Um, now, this morning, you are leading Labour's call on ministers to put UK steelmakers and uh, steel workers first with a stronger guarantee of a buy British uh, plan uh, for procurement. Um, what exactly do you want the government to do? Well, at, at the moment, uh, many of the big infrastructure projects that the government okay. uh, funds in this country, uh, too much of those uh, those contracts and of, of that money uh, is buying uh, foreign produced uh, steel around every uh, around 24 pence in every pound of steel required for these infrastructure projects goes abroad. And that's money lost to our economy. It's money lost to support uh, our workers and our capacity. And UK steel production is a foundational industry. It's not just that it supports well-played, decent jobs around the country, but that it is necessary for our security, our resilience and our broader manufacturing base. And we've got huge projects coming forward, HS2, uh, nuclear power, offshore wind, as well as our automotive sector, electric vehicles and aerospace and so on. And if the government uses its power of procurement, of its buying power to guarantee British steel, that will be a vital underpinning for this industry in, in years ahead. And it will uh, protect and create around 50,000 jobs. And, and, and a lot of those jobs, are, you know, well-paid jobs are yeah, supporting a lot of other jobs in their local communities. We know that. Of course, we've seen massive support for, for jobs in the last year. A lot of people are rather worried that we can't carry on doing that. There, there is a concern, though, isn't there, that what might be make sense in terms of keeping a vital industry alive? And goodness me, we've learned about the need for self-sufficiency, have we not, uh, in the last year? Uh, but that, that, that doesn't necessarily provide very good value for money for taxpayers, does it? Because once we know that there is a buy British uh, policy, um, those steel makers then are free to put their prices up to whatever they want. Well, I don't think we would we would see that. There's certainly competition within the UK domestic market anyway. But you're absolutely right. One of the things that we have learned in this pandemic is that we need to ensure and sustain uh, UK domestic production of these of these key uh, products because we don't want to have to rely on importing steel in order for to, for us to build these big infrastructure projects and for our future economy and one of the imbalances we've seen in the steel market over recent years is that particularly the chinese for example they've massively oversubsidized their own steel production in order to undercut uh, uk and european uh, steel production to put them out of business so that then they uh, can can monopolise the market, if you like. So, yes, it might have been cheaper at some points to buy Chinese steel, but that's not in the UK's long-term interest. So even if that is 
a little bit more expensive in the short term, it's vital for our economy and it's vital for the public purse in the long run. OK, it's, it's quite interesting to hear you those talking about you know, the, the need for us to sort of buy British, protect British jobs. Um, uh, when you're somebody who was uh, such a big fan of, of the European Union and of the free, free market there and not focusing on us, perhaps uh, looking, you know, looking at looking after Britain first. I must ask you about the, the prospect of today, as we've seen the EU, according to one paper today, saying to double down on the jab export ban. Uh, they're planning uh, to uh, European Commission to publish new proposals this morning to widen the criteria for b- uh, limits on vaccine exports from the bloc. Basically, if you've got a better, success, more successful vaccine rollout in your country, you ain't going to get any of the jabs that are produced uh, in the EU. Do you agree with the EU's stance on this? Is it right or, or are they are they in the wrong? No, I don't agree, agree with their stance on this. I think this would be the wrong road to go down for for Europe, uh, for the rest of the world, and it's not what we uh, we want to see. This kind of you know vaccine blockades or, or or vaccine bans and so on. It really is the wrong, very much the wrong direction of of, of travel. Uh, and, Bre- and just Brexit's, to get back to your earlier... Bre- Brexit's paid for itself already, hasn't it? Well, no, I'm not. I'm not sure about that. Look, it's, Are you I not? British. Well, we, we, look, we know I, that the vaccine rollout's been very successful. We got it sooner. We we uh, we approved it sooner. We got it rolled out sooner. The vaccine rollout has been one of the major successes mm-hmm. of this government's handling of the pandemic. And I know you and I will share a lot of the, uh, some some of the same criticisms uh, of of the government's handling of the pandemic. Um, the EU has, it's been an absolute disaster on all counts. Um, so the fact that we have done this, which we wouldn't have done if we'd stayed in the EU, because all the other EU countries stayed together, it would have been untenable for us to have, have stayed in the EU and to have gone alone on the vaccine. Brexit has paid for itself in terms of cost and in terms of lives saved, has it not? Well, the, definitely the, the vaccine model is a is, is one of the, the benefits, I think, of us having left the EU. And, and I'm not one of those people, by the way, who believes that everything about being in the EU is great and everything about it being out of it is bad or vice versa. I think you know, the, the whole being a member of the EU thing has costs and benefits. And, it, you know, the, the, there are balances in that. And I think one of the advantages of us being outside the EU is that we can be more nimble when it comes to things like the vaccine. And we can take a stronger uh, governmental role in um, in producing the vaccine and and getting it off the off the ground, for example, and that's exactly the same argument I would make about steel and other British industry. That one of the positives about leaving the EU is that we can support British business and British industry in a way that we haven't been able to in the past. And I want to see this government actually doing that now because that's what they said uh, they they would do. But there are costs to us being out of the EU too, and there are other businesses that are struggling with importing, exporting, you know, much uh, greater levels of bureaucracy and red tape now in in trading in a way that they used to be able to to freely trade. So there are costs and and benefits and and you highlight one benefit you know and and you're right to do so it's quite quite a big benefit though isn't it um let's talk about it's been um, a very big one i mean yeah. you i mean you you're a shadow minister for business and consumers I mean, an industry that really does fit, hit both of those right now is the travel industry uh, there's uh, you know foreign uh, foreign travel ban right now 5000 pound fine just for turning up at the airport without apparently a good excuse uh, the good excuse not including i'd like to go on holiday please i live in a free country apparently no longer passes muster um mass i mean massive issues for the travel industry on both sides of the channel, indeed, uh, and for the you know, airlines, ferry companies, everybody, train companies, everyone else in terms of this. Um, do, do you think that we will be able to travel abroad uh, during this summer or do you would, would, you, would Labour support a ban on foreign travel throughout the summer? Well, I really hope we're going to be able to, to, to travel this summer. I'm, I'm sure like most of your listeners, you know, I will I will be very much looking forward to to a break this this summer in the same way that everybody else uh, is. I think that what's the worst of all worlds at the moment is the sort of speculation in the media that all that does is really crush confidence in this sort of vital uh, industry at a, at a critical point for it after a year of, of, of refunds and, and no trade really uh, at all. So we, we need more certainty and we need a proper... Uh, roadmap for international travel as well. So part of that is, say, European holidays this summer, but also for our aerospace industry and and our aviation industry, 
they they need some more certainty around long haul flights as well going going forward so uh, i think you know let's just get rid of the speculation in the press i don't think that's helpful uh, for the government scientists or the government to do let's wait and see what they're um, report says in early April and hopefully that will bring some certainty for us all. Okay and just finally uh, talk about vaccinations uh, being rolled out to not just all adults in this country but to children as well. Um, would you give the Covid jab to your children? Uh, absolutely yeah I give make sure all my children have all the vaccines that they're, they're offered the annual flu vaccine which they get offered as well as uh, all the immunizations they would have as uh, as a younger child and, and so on so yeah more, I, mean, they, I mean they're at more risk of, of of a serious illness or dying of flu than they are of covid though aren't they but it's also about them as spreaders isn't it and you know and getting back to your point about family holidays and things if you can you know if you can help bring more um normality back for for the country okay. uh, as well you know i think um certainly teenagers you know have been shown to uh, to to be sort of uh, enabling kind of the spreading of the virus and things. So I think the more va- people we can get vaccinated safely, the better. And, and if it's being offered to children, you know, I will absolutely uh, sign mine up for that.